let me warmly congratulate you on the 20th anniversary of the European Payments Council. Your organization has been key to, transformation, to the transformation of Europe's payment uh, system into one of the most efficient in the world, seizing the opportunities offered by the single market and the introduction of the euro. Estimates suggest that Europeans pay far less for payment services today than Americans do. This was not the case years ago. These results were achieved thanks to the combined efforts of the public and private sector. Public institutions laid the foundations for these improvements. They brought stakeholders together to steer progress, first in the single Euro Payments Area Council and now in the Euro Retail Payments Board, the ERPB, that I have the privilege of chairing. Public authorities also introduced legislation where necessary for instance, to cap interchange fees for card payments and to limit the costs of cross-border transactions. And they broadened market access and competition. The private sector played a key role too by fostering innovation and efficiency. And the EPC helped make that possible by bringing payment service providers, the so-called PSPs together, in creating and managing the single Euro payments area, SIPA, you greatly contributed to the integration of European payments. The progress has been made, that has been made is remarkable. We can now all make credit transfers and set up direct, direct deb debits seamlessly across Europe by ensuring the smooth functioning of European payments uh, SIPA has facilitated trade across the continent, supporting economic growth and has strengthened the stability of the financial system. This has helped unlock the potential of the single market and bolstered confidence in the euro. We are now facing the challenge of digitalization. To stay at the technological frontier and satisfy consumers' demand for immediacy while preserving our sovereignty, Europe must promote digital innovation and efficiency in a way that corresponds to our societal preferences and objectives. We should roll out instant payments and make them the new normal. And we must build a truly European market with unified solutions for card and mobile payments, which are becoming increasingly popular among consumers. The Euro system is leading multiple initiatives here. Above all, we are closely cooperating with European Commission and European legislators on our retail payment strategy and the Digital Euro project. And the attention of European legislators on, uh, in the field, on the field of payment is enormous. Yesterday, I was in Parliament. I report regularly to Parliament about our initiatives, first and foremost, the Digital Euro and our retail payment strategy. I can assure you that European legislators are very um, attentive developments in this field. They understand that the strategic relevance of payments, the importance of payments for the smooth functioning of the monetary and financial system and for the economy at large. Today, I will look back at the progress made in the last two decades and outline the remaining steps that need to be taken to overcome fragmentation on the consumer uh, facing side of payment services. I will then explain how the digital euro could make it easier to achieve the objectives of our retail payment strategy. In particular, the creation of a truly pan-European payment solution, the full deployment of instant payments and support for innovation and digitalization. My main message today is that in order to successfully meet the challenges we face, we need the same cooperation between the public and private sectors that has been the hallmark of our success in building European payments market over the last 20 years. The payment market is developing at a fast pace and we need to jointly feel the urgency to deliver on the needs of Europeans. European integration reflects a political vision, a continuous effort to bring European countries closely, uh, closer together to secure peace, freedom and prosperity. Complementing European Monetary Union and the single uh, markets is a key part of that vision. In the payment sector, this requires Europeans to be able to pay seamlessly and PSPs to be able to operate, compete, and innovate across the Union. 
early efforts in this area focused on unifying central bank money. The cash changeover in 2002 marked a turning point in Europe's integration. The new Euro, Euro banknotes successfully replaced the legacy banknotes of the member states and rapidly became the most tangible expression of monetary unification. Today, Euro banknotes are the most popular instrument for in-person payments, although their use is declining as consumers are increasing paying digitally. In parallel, the Euro system also made enormous efforts to rapidly integrate wholesale payment systems, which support large payments between financial intermediaries. The transition from the national real-time growth settlement systems to a European system, with the launch of the target system in successive waves, created an efficient infrastructure for wholesale payments in central bank money accessible by European banks throughout the euro area. In, uh, in other words, euro area banks already benefit from a wholesale digital bank, uh, uh, central bank digital currency, wholesale CBDC. There's much discussion about building a wholesale CBDC. We do have a wholesale CBDC. It's called Target. It has been functioning quite well for the last uh, uh, 20 years. So we uh, should discuss how to maintain this very efficient infrastructure, how to update, to uh, uh, innovate the technology, but we do have a wholesale CBDC in the Euro area. Euro banknotes and our wholesale CBDC in the form of target services have ensured that central bank money in the Euro area can be used at both retail and wholesale level. Similar progress was also needed for retail payments based on private instruments. This was the starting point for the creation of SIPA, which aimed to make retail payments across borders as easy as within national borders. The first pan-European payment scheme, the scheme for credit transfers, was launched in 2008. Since then, we have come a long way. Households, firms, and governments can now make fast and efficient credit transfers and direct debit payments to anywhere in the European Union. Every year, over 43 billion, not million, billion payments are made through SIPA, uh, supported by almost 4,000 payment system providers that participate in one or more of the four payment schemes operated by the EPC. Within this ecosystem, the number of cross-border payments has increased significantly. The success of SIPA stands out in two ways. First, SIPA has become a model of successful partnership between public institutions and private intermediaries, and this is a fundamental, fundamental step we have taken in the past, on which I will uh, come back later. It stands as an example of the progress we can achieve in the payments sector when we work together. The public sector guided the transformation by making it easier for common systems, rules, and standards to be adopted. It helped to overcome differences between domestic payment markets, provide a common legal framework, and ensure timeless, timely progress. Equally crucial to SIPA's success was the ability to rely on a strong coalition of private market participants, which united all PSPs around a common vision. Today, the schemes managed by the EPC are used on a daily basis by 530 million citizens and 25 million firms, even outside the euro area. Second, SIPA's uh, success emphasized the benefits of innovation. The developments of the SIPA instant credit transfers uh, uh, scheme is preparing the European payment system for the future. And the Eurosystem's target instant payment settlement tips scheme enables for pan-European reachability and allows payments to be settled immediately around the clock on every day of the year. This has enabled banks and other payment intermediaries to satisfy customers' demand for immediacy in the digital age and TIPS is also starting to be adopted beyond the euro area in several countries. SIPA has thus significantly contributed to an efficient, integrated, and innovative payment system, but the progress that has been made so far is not enough. In some cases, the creation of pan-European market infrastructures, the back end, has not been accompanied by similar progress with user-facing systems, the, the, the front end. We need to implement SIPA for card, online, and mobile payments in order to eliminate the residual fragmentation that is 
hampering or even preventing European customers from using their national payment solutions in all European markets. Not only would this allow us to reap the benefits of economies of scale, it would also help avoid our retail payments market needing to rely on non-European providers to offer pan-European solutions, which is the situation we currently have for card payments. I therefore welcome the fact that the EPC is contributing to the further integration that is needed in this field. This brings me to another challenge we face. Innovative digital retail payment solutions are not widely available in all European countries and even less so on a pan-European basis. In many cases, digital payment solutions have limited coverage, are not based on instant settlement and are not interoperable across Europe. This discourages people from using them. And this is a typical problem in payments, where both sides of the market may lack incentives to adopt new solutions. Take the example of instant payments. Not all uh, PSPs use this payment method. Therefore, some suppliers may be hesitant to make the significant investments needed uh, for it to be adopted more quickly. At the EU level, 61% of PSPs have joined the SET in scheme, and only 12% of all SIPA credit transfer transactions are actually carried out as instant payments. On the user side, consumers may be deterred from using instant payments as they are often marketed as a premium service with the associated high prices. As I highlighted last year, it costs service providers 0.2 euro cent, that is 0.002 euros per transaction to use tips. Yet, instant payments are sometimes offered to consumers for one euro per transaction and even more. My ch bank charges me more. Both sides of the market, PSPs and end users, may therefore be discouraged from swiftly adopting instant payments, and this, in turn, prevents network effects. To address this situation, we need to work on completing the rates by completing the adoption of SCT inst and making the payment solutions available. If we fail to meet users' demand for innovative payments, others will fill this gap. And this may, in turn, raise more fundamental concerns. For example, we are seeing global technology companies, the so-called big techs, taking on a greater role in providing front-end solutions to customers. While these companies may help to improve efficiency, relying too much on a handful of non-European providers and on infrastructures operated abroad could ultimately harm competition, making the European payment market less dynamic, less diverse, and less innovative. We are in favor of competition, but precisely for this reason, we should not leave uh, too much room for maneuver to uh, uh, foreign players that could rapidly acquire enormous market power. It could also leave strategic sectors of our economy exposed to influence by market players that do not necessarily share Europe's societal and strategic goals. Back in 2019, the Eurosystem launched a comprehensive retail payment strategy to involve the private sector in achieving an integrated, innovative, and independent European payments market. Among a number of private initiatives launched to meet the objectives of the retail payment strategy, a group of major euro area banks have established the European Payment Initiative. Their aim is to create a unified payment solution for European consumers and merchants alike. This reflects an uh, awareness that the fragmented nature of the European market makes it difficult to compete with large international players when it comes to digital payments, and that only by joining forces can intermediaries reach the necessary scale to offer competitive pan-European payment solutions. But it, it has become clear that coordinating such cross-border projects represents a formidable challenge. Agreeing on a shared approach to migrate from established domestic uh, payment solutions to a European uh, standard inevitably presents obstacles given individual countries' legacy payment systems and preferences. 
This makes it difficult to involve all Euro area countries from the start and the entire European Union in the end. This ability to overcome differences and achieve pan-European scale is exactly what made SIPA so remarkable. SIPA's success shows the obstacles that obstacles can be overcome if public authorities and private partners work together towards a common goal. These considerations raise the question of whether public authorities should step up their role once again, working even more closely with European intermediaries to achieve our strategic goals for retail payments. At the same time, the European Central Bank is facing the growing challenge of ensuring central bank that central bank money remains available and usable for retail payments in an increasingly digitalized world. And this is the primary reason why the euro system is exploring the possibility of issuing a digital euro to complement cash. So let me clarify this once and for all. I did it several times. I'm sure I will have to do it many more times in the future. The European Central Bank uh, did not start the digital euro project because we want to become a commercial bank, because we want to deal with end users, because we want to have any business relationship with uh, consumers, with uh, Europeans. We do want to ensure that uh, sovereign money, central bank money remains available. Think of a world in 20 years from now where everything will be digitalized. Of course, cash will become a marginal means of payment. And uh, we know that this would have a number of consequences. Cash, central bank money, a riskless asset is everywhere for centuries. The numeraire, the anchor for the stability of the system. We cannot have equilibrium in the long run unless we have this anchor, this riskless asset available. And the riskless asset is central bank money. Given that preferences are shifting towards digital payments and given that the world is becoming digitalized, we have to act now to be sure that in the future, if need be, we will be able to provide citizens, again, also in the future, uh, central bank money, of course, in digital form. For a digital euro to be successful, everyone should be able to use it for digital payments throughout the euro area. It would provide a pan-European means of exchange, just like cash, in line with people's expectations. And this comes from our uh, focus group interviews, from our consultation, and from contacts we have uh, with uh, um, specific groups in the ERPB and in other uh, fora. We are currently investigating how a digital euro should be designed to be a convenient and efficient means of payment for end users and merchants while responding to Europe's societal preferences, for instance, on privacy. We have been clear from the outset that we see financial intermediaries having a crucial role in distributing and promoting the digital euro. By design, the digital euro will not crowd out existing uh, private financial instruments. Rather, it will preserve the coexistence of central bank money and private money supporting innovation by private intermediaries. I would be happy to uh, say more on this. Uh, our digital euro project may therefore provide a suitable opportunity to establish the public public-private cooperation that is needed to build the pan-European private retail payment solutions of the future. This would combine the comparative advantages of the euro system in relation to large-scale payment infrastructure with the expertise of private sector partners when it comes to distributing payment products and interacting with end users. And this could bring two fundamental benefits. First, it would allow us to achieve the required scale and scope by enabling PSPs from all Euro area countries to participate and all key use cases to be included. Intermediaries could build a range of innovative payment and financial services on top of the digital euro. Second, the euro system in close cooperation with the European Commission and co-legislators would bring a strong European dimension that all stakeholders could get behind. Given the great diversity of the stakeholders involved, it is necessary to involve all of them and to carefully balance their needs and interests. A successful public-private partnership building on an attractive value proposition for consumers, merchants, and PSPs alike could support the objectives of our retail payments strategy. It would help us integrate the European payments market and further digitalize the European economy, and by building on European infrastructure and governance, 
it would support Europe's strategic autonomy in payments. Let me conclude. Over the past 20 years, the European payment market has become more integrated, more innovative, and more efficient. The successful transition from a fragmented payment ecosystem to the single euro payments area contributed to the smooth introduction of the single currency. And it was the combined knowledge and efforts of both public authorities and private intermediaries that made this possible. This cooperation is more important than ever today as we face renewed challenges stemming from the digitalization of our economies and our financial systems. The Euro system is working on several fronts to meet these challenges, most notably by exploring the possible introduction of a digital euro and by implementing its retail payment strategy. In the coming months, we will step up our interaction with the private sector to explore the links between these two crucial projects our retail payments strategy and the digital euro with the cooperation of the private sector. Combining our strengths, our means public and private players, and working together towards a common goal remains the best way to build a modern, efficient and inclusive European payment system for the future. Thank you very much. Sorry for being long. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Panetta. If I may, lately in your speech, you have referred to the opportunities for public-private cooperation that is necessary for building tomorrow's pan-European retail payment solutions. And you have mentioned uh, several angles on how this cooperation could take place. How do you foresee organizing such interaction between the different uh, participants and with the market uh, participants on digital euro to achieve this uh, uh, aimed cooperation. Thank you for your question, which uh, allows me to clarify a number of um, elements of our uh, uh, strategy for retail payments and the interconnection with the Digital Euro project. First of all, let me emphasize once again what is the main motivation for the Digital Euro project. We want to maintain central bank money at the center of the financial system. This is our role, the role of the central bank. This is an element, the availability of riskless money that has been part of financial systems for centuries. It started in ancient Greece, the Roman emperors, Charlemagne, uh, all uh, uh, different phases of history have been characterized by innovations, but one of them, has, one element has remained uh, uh, constant, that is the availability of sovereign money. The first thing that uh, Charlemagne did when he became emperor was a monetary reform to spread the use of the, the, the uh, sovereign money that he introduced all over his empire. And uh, we will not deviate from this. We will not take the risk of um, depriving the financial sector of a riskless asset. Uh, but uh, we don't want to do this by expanding our role. We want to remain a central bank, of course. Um, and we want to clarify that this is not a threat for uh, the private sector, for private uh, service providers. This is an opportunity. Let me uh, try to clarify why. Think of the counterfactual. What would be the world, the financial system, the payment sector of the future in case the central bank doesn't start this project uh, for a digital currency? It will not be the system we see today. It will be a totally different system where most likely the main challenge to uh, private service providers in payments in the financial sector at large would be coming from the big techs, the large multinational players. And believe me, they will uh, pay much less attention to the smooth functioning of the financial system, to the vital role of private service providers than the central bank. We do understand the importance of a vibrant, efficient financial sector, private financial sector, in which private service providers compete against each other to offer efficient, uh, low-cost, uh, reliable, secure uh, services to their customers. So don't expect, do not dream of a world that 20 years from now will be the same without an SCBDC. It will be a totally different world. And from what we see today, the possibility that uh, large foreign players will play uh, 
Can I say excessive, an excessive role? I'm in favor of open competition, international competition. But competition requires that nobody has a dominant position in uh, the financial sector. So uh, we are uh, starting to um, work on this project today to be ready in, f in the future if necessary. Uh, how can this uh, improve uh, private-public uh, cooperation? It must improve private-public cooperation. Uh, our intention is to offer, uh, let me call it, a, the raw material for the financial sector to work. We are not uh, in any way planning to start dealing with end users. We are already interacting in the EIPB, in our market advisory group, in uh, 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 many different ways, and we'll intensify our contacts with private players. We want to adopt standards, solutions, uh, technical uh, 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 solutions that are fully interoperable with the standards of the private sector. We will intensify our contacts to be sure that what we will do will uh, provide uh, private uh, players uh, an instrument that they can use to build uh, efficient, innovative services, smart contracts, uh, other, any other uh, smart product you, you will invent in, in the future on top of a digital Europe, which could offer the possibility to innovate more broadly, even to those intermediaries that are otherwise would be cut out of the competition with the super big uh, 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 digital players. So w we need to have the cooperation of the private sector at the same time. Why, why would we never be able to reach the, 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 the retail customers? We will never be able to deal with uh, hundreds of millions of, of customers. There are 2,500,000 bank employees in the, in the euro area, a few tens of thousands of central banks. There's no way, even if we were crazy enough to dream of becoming uh, involved in dealing with retail uh, customers, we could never do it. We don't know how to do it. We don't have the resources. We don't want to do it. My job is already very time consuming, too much. And uh, uh, we want to interact with those who are in this business, who have the expertise, which is the private financial sector in uh, uh, the Euro area. And uh, we don't have a, a grand plan in, in mind. What I did today is uh, a sort of provocation. We are reflecting, of course, internally, which for this cooperation could take. I mentioned, for example, the EPI. The EPI was a highly variable initiative which was launched, I'm sure you are all familiar with it, by a group of European banks. It did not uh, uh, achieve what uh, was expected. And it's a pity. Uh, but this means that there is need for support by a coordinator, by an external, external uh, player that could help gather forces as it happened in the last 20 years for the launch of SIPA. The reason why I was long, and the reason why I'm still long in my, in my reply to your question, is that I want to be sure that uh, I am understood clearly enough. Uh, we do want to cooperate. We do want to seek uh, advice, suggestions, indications. We uh, do think that there's value added for both, and we think that a cooperation, a renewed cooperation, private, public, can do a lot of good in the future.